Kazaki show on the trap. Sweet. Anyway, continuing on with one of my favorite things about the NHL right now, the outdoor game. Today we're talking about our third outdoor game or our second NHL Winter Classic, depending on which way you want to look at it, really. But, needless to say, by this time, it's now an annual event. So, there's a lot more to do here. <laughs> but that's okay. I got time. So anyway, let's talk about the amazing game that was the 2009 NHL Winter Classic, which saw the Chicago Blackhawks hosting the Detroit Red Wings. Let's do it. So the 2009 edition of the NHL Winter Classic was played on January 1st, 2009 at Wrigley Field, home of Major League Baseball's Chicago Cubs. The weather recorded this day was at 5 degrees Fahrenheit, which if you translate that to Canadian is chilly, but not terribly cold. All told, 40,818 people were in attendance, which as of this point, makes it the lowest attended outdoor game in its brief history. But again, it's brief. And that number won't be the lowest total for very long. Now to add context to this conversation, Wrigley Field wasn't the first choice. There were other venues in mind, such as the original Yankee Stadium in New York, which, had that happened... It would have been the last event to take place at Old Yankee Stadium, as it had been slated for demolition. Beaver Stadium was also under consideration, which, for note, is the second largest sports venue in North America. And finally, Soldier Field was also in consideration for this game. But the problem with NFL stadiums is you have to worry about playing around playoff time which in a sense made Wrigley Field a much smarter choice. So with that decision, the 09 Winter Classic became the first outdoor game, and not the last, the first outdoor game played in a baseball diamond. On top of that, it was also the first game to feature two original six rivals, as well as the first game to feature two divisional rivals. Because you got to remember at this time, the Red Wings did play in the Western Conference and were in the Central Division. So if you're all about rivalry hockey, this one was for you. So with all that being said, let's have a look at the lineups. So as with all Winter Classics, the retro look was in full effect. And here's where Detroit got theirs. Now the Red Wings uniform is pretty simplistic, but the idea, the inspiration behind it comes from the 1926-27 Detroit Cougars. The only difference, obviously, being A, the uniform's a lot more modern, B, the pants were red instead of white, but the barber pole socks still matched. Of course, the 26-27 season was also Detroit's first season in the NHL, although they were the Cougars and not the Red Wings. The history still stands. And here's your lineups. Now you see a lot of good names in there. Lidstrom, Datsuk, Chelios, the ageless wonder that he is, is in this game. Ty Conklin making his third straight outdoor game start. You know, at this point, I think he just signed with teams that play exclusively outdoors, which I guess isn't a bad thing. But you carry on. Draper, Zetterberg, Hosa. Like, still. Stacked. Babcock is your coach. Thomas Kopecky and Derek Meach are your healthy scratches. Whereas the Blackhawks took a different approach. They took inspiration from two separate seasons. The 37-38 and 36-37 seasons. I'll explain. The jersey comes from the uniforms they wore from 1935 to 1937. And the logo comes inspired from 1937-38. But all told, it was a great look. 
I mean, I liked it. And they carried it after for years. Now, if you look at the Blackhawks roster, you find the same thing as the Detroit roster. The names. You know, Keith, Taves, Havlat. I mean, he was good at the time. Bufflin, name you don't see anymore. Cristobal Hue was your starting goalie. And Brian Campbell playing in his second straight outdoor game. And then you got Patrick Kane as well. Joel Quinville's your coach. And Aaron Johnson and Adam Burrish are your healthy scratches for this one. Now before we start, there's one thing I point I want to point out that I kind of noticed between this game and the one previously in 08. They were getting a little more visually aesthetic. Meaning they were throwing a lot more backdrop pieces and some more art in there. I mean, it's not to what we're used to in, not, in modern standards. But it was the start. So, I've wasted enough time. Let's get to the first period. Now, this one started off physical. Right out of the gate. I mean, there was hitting and all kinds of aggressive plays. And wouldn't you know it, the first penalty came within the first minute. And I mean, that should be expected amongst division rivals, right? As Pavel Datsuk would be called for hooking at the 37 minute mark, or 37 second mark, sorry. <laughs> at 206, you know, they didn't really learn anything from their first penalty, as they would take a too many men on the ice penalty, and the Blackhawks would capitalize. As Christopher Stieg would score his 11th on the year on the power play from Martin Havlat and Brent Seabrook at the 324 mark, giving Chicago the early 1 0 lead. And then Chicago would start running into penalty trouble as Ben Eager would take a slashing penalty at 4.52, and then Dustin Bufflin would follow that up with a roughing penalty at 7.53. And it was at that point, Detroit would start to capitalize themselves. Mikhail Samuelson would score his eighth on the year on the power play from Henrik Zetterberg and Marion Hossa to tie the game at one at the 9.50 mark. Yeah, get used to hearing Zetterberg and Hossa quite often. But that wasn't good enough for Detroit as they would find themselves in more Penalty trouble after Brent Lebda took a delay of game penalty, only for Chicago to come right back. So Martin Havlat would score his 10th on the year on the power play from Chris Versteeg and Brian Campbell at the 12.37 mark to give Chicago the 2-1 lead. So it's an interesting th thing to note. First three goals of the game are all power play goals. They're not the last, I can guarantee you that. Now, Andre Lilia would put Detroit back in the penalty box at the 1301 mark for roughing, but by this point, they're pretty much done scoring in the first up until the 1918 mark, as Ben Eager would score his seventh on the year for Martin Havlat to give Chicago the 3 1 lead as we come to the end of the first period. Chicago would end this period leading in shots by one, outshooting Detroit 14-13. to 13. But the important thing is here is that first period was pretty awesome. Now, if the first period started out physical, the second period started out quick, at least for Detroit. As Yuri Hoodler would score his 14th of the season at a minute 14, Again, from Hossa and Zetterberg, to bring Detroit within one. And as if getting assists wasn't enough, Marion Hossa would get called for goaltender interference at 428. And not even seven seconds after that, Jonathan Taves would get called for high sticking. Essentially, though, there was no scoring during that four-on-four -four play. After that, Brian Campbell would get called for tripping at 1042, and again, Detroit would capitalize, as Yuri Hoodler would score his 15th, as well as his second of the game, from Brian Rafalski and Nick Lidstrom at the 12.43 mark to tie the game at 3. Now what's interesting, is if Hoodler had been a second or two sooner, that would have been another power play goal. But the important thing here, is we're tied at 3. The important thing, too, is we're seeing a lot of goals. And things would go back and forth in the second period until the 17-17 mark. 
was the magician himself, Pavel Datsuk, would be an absolute magician and put in an absolute beauty of a goal for his 16th of the year from Johan Franzen and Brian Rafalski to give Detroit the 4-3 lead. And that would be it for the second period. Both teams would come out of the second period tied in shots with 13 apiece. Detroit still trailing behind one shot. But let's go on to the third. And the third period would start off with James Wisniewski putting Chicago back in the penalty box at 220 for holding. And the Red Wings would, again, capitalize. As Brian Rafalski would score his fifth on the season on the power play from Yuri Hoodler and Thomas Holmstrom to give the Red Wings the 5-3 lead. Now this goal also sets the record for the most goals scored by one team in an outdoor game, as well as the most goals in an outdoor game since 2003, breaking the old mark of seven. And not even 17 seconds after that, Brett Lebda would score his third on the season, Again, from Zetterberg and Hossa to give the Red Wings a 6-3 to three lead. It was at this point where Cristobal Hue would get chased out of the net. And the Bulin wall himself, Nikolai Happy Bulin, would be sent in, in in relief. First time a goaltender got pulled in an outdoor game. But at this point, Detroit's pretty much done their scoring. After Valtteri Filpula would take a holding penalty at 1907, Chicago was once again on the power play. And we couldn't just end the game without another power play goal, could we? Of course not. Duncan Keith would score his fifth of the season on the power play with 10 seconds left in the game from Patrick Sharp and Jonathan Taves to make it a 6-4 game. Now, unfortunately for Chicago, there was only 10 seconds left in the game. And when there's really only 10 seconds left, there's really not enough time to pad any momentum to try and at least make it 6-5, much less to tie the game at 6. So with that, time expires. Detroit wins your third outdoor game, 6-4. to four. Sh- Detroit would outshoot Chicago in this period, 17-10, to 10, and beat them in the amount of total shots, 43-37. to 37. Let's wrap it up. Before I wrap it up, though, it's probably important to note, Detroit went 2 for 5 on the power play. Chicago went 3 for 6 on the power play. On to- uh, all told, those 5 power play goals set the record for most power play goals in any of the outdoor games. On top of, you know, the most goals in a game with 10, the most penalty minutes called with 22. Five players hit 3 points. And physicality was definitely not out of the question. So with all those elements put together, I'd have to say by this point, this one was probably, with everything thrown in there, this was probably the best of the three outdoor games by this point. And when you have that kind of excitement, of course, people are going to come in droves to see more of this. Thankfully, it's an annual event. So if I was to grade this game on a scale of five, I gave it a six. It's another one of my chess hockey shows. I want to thank you for tuning in. Don't think I don't appreciate the gesture, especially if you're at this point. Because, I mean, this was a bit of a long video, so that's okay. There's nothing wrong with long videos. But if you liked it, if you're here, or if you just want to say hi, you dig what I'm doing, give me a thumbs up. I think I've earned it. The red button. If you haven't done so yet, you know you want to. We're pushing 250, and we're getting close. So let's make that button make you happy. Let's do it up. My social is in the description down below. Let's so move forward. For the month of February, I promise more content. A lot more. I mean, I've already got my next couple videos mapped out. Just a matter of doing them. As for the winter, or as for the outdoor games, well, there's the 2010 Winter Classic. So, 
look for that. Either way, meantime, in between time, be looking forward to some Trev. Later.